Good evening, everyone. So today we're going to go through a few cases. Um, so we try to do two groups of uh, cases if we have the time, right? So let's go to case number one. So this is a parastinal long axis view, okay? So parastinal long axis view, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Any abnormalities? The interventricular septum is very thick. Okay, so what is your differential diagnosis? Okay. Hocum. So one of it, of course, is hokum. If you know, if there's if not hokum, infiltrative. So what other reason the patient can have such a thick septum like this? Mm. Amyloidosis. Yes, cardiac amyloidosis. And last one. Fibris. Yes, and this is fibrous disease. Oh, yeah. So that's all. Uh, is it possible that this is due to hypertension? Um. Possible. Yeah, but I have to measure the, the yeah, thickness. But, but it's, this is too big. Usually, what I do is, you know, let's say the thickness is more than one point eight centimeter. It is very, very unlikely to be because of hypertension. It's still possible, but unlikely. I think more than two centimeter is extremely rare. So I think this is like maybe three point five, three point six centimeter. Okay. So okay, let's go to the the other view. So that's your differential diagnosis right now, right? Okay, let's go to the other view. Okay, what about now? Oh. So huge. <laughs> is it a mass? <laughs> yes. So this is actually a mass that uh, masquerade as a you know like a left ventricular hypertrophy. So uh, so let's say I tell you that this is a mass. So what is your differential diagnosis for this mass? Sarcoma. Okay, sarcoma. Okay, let's say if let's say that I say okay if they say this is a sarcoma, right? So what is the type of sarcoma? So sarcoma is a soft tissue tumor. So there is many different type of sarcoma. Okay, so you have uh, angiosarcoma, you have osteosarcoma, you have leiomyosarcoma, you have rhabdosarcoma, you have uh, many different sarcoma. So what type of sarcoma? If this is a sarcoma, what is the most common primary malignant tumor of the heart? Rhabdomyo. Yeah, the most common primary malignant tumor of the heart is angiosarcoma. Okay, uh, but precious, you are correct. You see that this is a rhabdosarcoma. How do you know that? How why do you think that this is rhabdo rather than the other sarcoma? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I just guess. Okay, ceiling. <laughs> so the precious answer is correct. So this is actually rhabdo sarcoma. So angiosarcoma is the most common primary malignant tumor of the heart. Okay, so but this is a rhabdo sarcoma. How do precious know that this is rhabdo sarcoma rather than other other type of sarcoma? Ceiling. Mm -hmm. Do we need to do contrast? I mean, of course, that is one of the way to do it, lah. Okay, so um, one to 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 confirm it, you have to do some other thing. You obviously cannot just confirm from this echo alone. But let's say we already know that this is a prim primary malignant tumor. So we know that the most common primary malignant tumor is angiosarcoma, but this is not angiosarcoma. In fact, this is rhabdosarcoma. Now, how does Precious know that this is rhabdosarcoma, but not the other type of sarcoma? The location. So what? Okay, location. So that is very correct. So can you explain a little bit more? What was the problem with the location here? Why is it so, involves the septum okay. rather than the lateral fever? Okay. So Sarah, you want to cry? Why is this rhabdosarcoma rather than other type of sarcoma? Uh, I mean, rhabdo is usually the snowflake like appearance, right? <laughs> okay. I don't know. That's what it's <laughs> no, it's basically based on the localization of the mass. So just to, to give, uh, so just you have to tell you tell that uh, angiosarcoma is the most common primary malignant tumor of the heart. So there's a lot of different type of sarcoma, but angiosarcoma most commonly uh, affect the right side of the heart, and especially the border between the right atrium and right ventricle at the right atrial ventricular groove or even right atrium. So that is the most common place of angiosarcoma. The other sarcoma, such as uh, leomyosarcoma, osteosarcoma, or undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, they are all most commonly in the left atrium. Okay? They are most commonly on the left atrium. The sarcoma that most commonly happen in the ventricles is rhabdosarcoma. That's the only one that most commonly mm. happen in the ventricle. Okay? So if it's the ventricle, it is rhabdosarcoma most commonly. If right side, right atrium, it is angiosarcoma. Uh, angiosarcoma. The left side is all other sarcoma. 
Okay, so the lesson is this: is one one of the lesson is if you see mass in the left atrium, right, you will say that oh, this unlikely to be malignant because on the left side that is wrong, because most other sarcoma occur on the left side of the heart. It's okay, especially undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, and I see two of them, those already. Okay, so this actually, uh, rhabdo sarcoma. So you are right. So this is rhabdo sarcoma. So the most common primary malignant tumor of the heart is angiosarcoma. It is most likely situated in the RA and RV, especially uh, at the groove between right atrium and right ventricle. So sarcoma is a soft tissue tumor. Rhabdomyosarcoma most often occurs in the left ventricle, just like what this patient has. So the other sarcoma, so leomyosarcoma, fibrosarcoma, osteosarcoma, and poorly differentiated sarcoma occur mostly in the left atrium. Okay, so that is rhabdosarcoma. Rhabdomyoma, on the other hand, it is not a malignant tumor. It is actually a primary benign tumor. It happened in infancy in children. So this is a most common primary tumor in childhood. It's rhabdomyoma rather than rhabdomyosarcoma. So rhabdomyoma, it is not malignant. Yet myoma and can occur with multiple mass. It can disappear uh, spontaneously. Okay, looks at this next case. Okay, so this is a transesophageal view of a structure. Transesophageal view. So this is left ventricle. The top there is left atrium. Okay, so maybe we start with ceiling first. What do you think of this mass here? Mass in the left atrium, ceiling. Left atrium, left ventricle, mitral valve. Left atrium. I think there's a mass in there. Yeah this, uh, yeah, this thing, this rounded stuff. Mm. So it's okay. either fibro, osteo, or leo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Let's see, I, let, okay, let's see, I, let's see, I change my differential analysis and I see that this is not a malignant tumor. Yeah. Rhabdomyoma. Uh, remember, rhabdomyoma happen commonly in the ventricles and multiple. Oh. Mm. Mixoma. Okay, so one of the most common primary malignant tumor, primary benign tumor is cardiac myxoma. But does that look like myxoma to you? No. It look like what? Like cystic structure. Like cystic structure, correct. What do you think uh, uh, this is, Precious? Is there a cystic cirrhosis of the heart? I don't okay, know. cystic cirrhosis is the, uh, I think it is a uh, <laughs> uh, parasite infection of the heart. Okay, all right. <laughs> well, uh, Saravanan, you want to try? I mean, it looks like cystic lesion. Very good. It looks like a cystic lesion. Okay, so what if let's say this is a cystic lesion? So what is your diagnosis? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> okay, so one of the things that can look like this in echo is interatrial septal aneurysm, but this is not interatrial septal aneurysm. Okay, so let's look at the other one. Okay, so this is the color flow, and the color flow actually go across around the mass. So this um, proof that this is not an artifact. Possibly, it's not an artifact. Okay, can you see the color flow there? Yeah. yeah. All right. Is it the sinister? Nope. It's possible. So that is one another different, good differential analysis called triatriatum sinister, okay, which is a membrane in the left atrium. Okay. All right. What about now? This is, okay, this is a, again, this is a left atrium, left ventricle. Okay, now, now you see this, this image. What is your analysis? Do you want to change from myxoma to something else or do you want to continue with myxoma ceiling? Hmm. Not sure. What about you, Sarah? Hmm. Not sure. Eh? So I just wanted to tell you, whenever you see a cyst like this, the differential diagnosis, of course, one of it is a cystic structure, such as interatrial septal aneurysm, or even sometime uh, after the ablation procedure, you can actually inject the wall of the left atrium and cause dissection of the left atrium. So that is also possible. But the problem with echo, of course, it is a two-dimensional structure. Sometimes it's difficult for you to see what is happening. So from here, it might look like a cyst, but from a different way, it might look like a different thing. So I wanted to show you the value of using a 3D transesophageal echocardiogram. So let's say we do. A... So I change to you now. Now this is the 3D echo. So that's the left atrium, and this is the mass there. Okay, so that's the left atrium. That's mass. That's correct. So this is a myxoma. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, ceiling are correct. Patients are correct. This is actually a myxoma. So just wanted to show you. You can never be certain with echocardiogram. Um, so there's always a lot of different uh -huh. diagnoses going on. So this is actually a myxoma. It is actually a the uh a special type of myxoma called a cystic atrial myxoma. It's a cystic atrial myxoma. Mm. 
So that myxoma can appear at typical each shape. For example, of a cystic atrial myxoma. So towards our cases, we see a lot of different uh, example of uh, atypical presentation of UMS. So that's the pathology okay, of cystic atrial myxoma. <laughs> Just take a minute, All right. So this is number three. So this is left atrium and left ventricle. So this is a manual format. Okay. Uh, every time I show you a manual format, I tell you the only different manual format is that the left ventricle is on the left side. Uh, I don't know why they wanted to be special. They never give me the reason. But the left ventricle is on the left side. So that is left atrium, left ventricle, right atrium, and right ventricle. Okay. So. Ventricular aneurysm. Okay, so you can something something wrong here at the region of uh, ventricular septum. Um, mm. So it's at the region of ventricular septum, and you can see a little bit of aorta there. Okay, yeah. so this might be like an apical five chamber view. That's here. Okay, now look at the color flow. Any comment on the color flow? Anyone can say whatever they want. Any comment on the color flow? Any shun or not from the left ventricle to the right ventricle? The shun also goes yes. to the... Is there any shun from the left ventricle to the right ventricle? Yes. Are you sure? We'll see one more time. Is there any flow going through from left ventricle going into the right ventricle? From the right ventricle to the left ventricle. <laughs> left ventricle to the left ventricle. Actually, there is no shun, okay? There's no, nothing crossing uh -huh. the interatrial septum, okay? Mm. But there's something there, right? There's some abnormal structure there, right? What do you think is that no abnormal structure? Right, that's a bit wrong. <laughs> okay, let's go to the other side. Okay, good. Okay, now, okay. Sarah, what do you think now? So this is a short axis view. It's a sinus valsava aneurysm. Possible, that's one of the good, 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 good. Uh, good uh, diagnosis. So, so let's say this is not a sinus valsalva aneurysm. It's a tricuspid valve. Okay. Let's see. I have. Let's see. I have a hole there, right? What is that? Mm -hmm. Let's see. I have a hole there. VSD. Okay. This VSD. Okay. Now, if I have a hole there, what kind of VSD is it? Perimembranous. So it's going to be perimembranous VSD. Okay. But when we look at the color, there is no flow, right? from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. So let's say we have a VST, but we have no flow from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. So what's happening? There is no flow from Just left to the right. There is a right. ventricular septal defect, but there is no oh. flow from the left ventricle to right ventricle. What is happening? Bidirectional shunt. No, nope. bidirectional meaning there is flow, right from left mm -hmm. to right and right to Formary left. Formerly hypertension. No. Nope. Isomango, no. Nope. Nope. Look at this, look at the, look at the, Look at what happening in the ventricular septum there. There's something there. Is it just a membrane? Yeah, it is a. So let us let me tell you that this is a perimembranous ventricular septal defect. Sarah is correct. However, there is no shun between the left ventricle and right ventricle. Why do you think that is? Equalization of the pressure. Okay. So this membranous VSD is usually adjacent to the right coronary cusp. Okay. And also adjacent to the septal leaflet to the of the tricuspid valve. So what is happening causing that the causing the so what happened oh. in this situation this is one of the complication of uh, perimembranous PSD. it can cause aortic regurgitation because uh. the right coronary can prolapse into the hole mm. it also can cause septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve to prolapse in the hole as well okay not just the right coronary so in this situation the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve have prolapsed into the ventricular septal defect and closed the hole. Oh, okay, so that so that's what happened. Okay, so this is a patient with a perimembranous VSD. However, the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve has gone and plugged the hole of the VSD. The problem with that is, of course, you can have what? Tricuspid regurgitation. Tricuspid So you have to correct that. Mm. Right, so yeah, for example, there is you can say that there is no flow from the left ventricle to the right ventricular outflow tract. So this is the ventricular septal defect, okay, but with the prolapse of septal leaflet. So, so the diagnosis mm. is not outlet VSD because outlet VSD will be beside the pulmonary valve, and outlet VSD is not near the uh, tricuspid valve. It's not supracrystal. Basically, supracrystal and outlet is the same VSD. 
there's nothing to do with right coronary artery. I didn't show right coronary artery here. And of course, the answer is perimembranous VST. Okay. So I already explained that uh, this is the hallmark of perimembranous ventricular septal defect. And the septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve actually have gone into that uh, defect. And even though the ventricular septal defect is small, the tricuspid regurgitation, or if let's say it involves the aortic valve, aortic regurgitation, that might be a reason for us to close the VSD, even though the VSD itself is small. Remember that outlet VSD and supracriastal VSD is the same entity. So I've given talk on atrial septal defect. Uh, I think next week I'll give a talk on ventricular septal defect. VSD is a very difficult topic. I am struggling to, you know, to understand it uh, at the moment. Okay, so this is another example of cases. Okay, so in these cases, uh, someone has been injected a bubble on the right side of the hand, so on the right brachial vein. Okay, so this is the bubble. This is a sh I show you the bubble study here over a few bits. Okay, right. I show you the bubble study over a few bits. Okay, right. Let, okay, let's see from the start. Okay, right. Okay, now this is bubble going in. Okay, this is the start. Okay. Start the bubble mm -hmm. study. One bit, two bit. Then it comes. Okay. Then it goes and fill in. Okay. You want to see one more time from start to the bubble filling in. Start. This bubble filling in. All right. So anyone wanted to uh, jump in with the diagnosis? Intro yeah, central Okay, so all right. all right, so you want to say that this is atrial septal defect, okay? Now, of course, atrial septal defect is possible. That is possible, the answer. So let's say I tell you that this patient does not have atrial septal defect. What mm. other diagnosis? BFO. So one is, of course, pattern foramen, pattern foramen ovale, okay? But if you look at the time where the, if you look at the time, it takes for the bubble to appear on the left side of the heart, okay? Do you think that the time it took is short or rather long? Long. long. Okay, the time it took is long. So usually an interatrial shunt, it will usually the bubble will appear on the left side within three bits, okay? So this bubble appear longer than three bits. So the usually, if let's say you have bubble that appear longer than three bits, what is the diagnosis? Persistent left FCC. No, persistent left VC, you give on the left vein and you go into the coronary sinus. Not unroof. Think, think first before you say it. Okay. <laughs> you can see that the, the, the CS is not dilated, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so the differential analysis of a short versus a long one. So if they say you have something that appear later, that is, remember, atriovenous malformation atrial venous malformation of the lung where you have a vessel that bypass the lung and connect the pulmonary artery to the pulmonary vein straight away. Okay. Another thing that you can see in the appearance of bubble, you can see that the bubble fill in gradually. It's a little bit, a little bit more, then a little bit more. It doesn't feel like PFO. PFO will feel like a like a puff, like a burst, burst, and then after that, it disappears. So that is PFO. But if you see here, it actually takes time before it fill up and fill up and fill up more and it take longer. So that's actual venous malformation. If you look at this different one, so what is this structure here? What is I'm, I'm showing here? Ceiling? Mm -hmm. what, what view is this? Huh? So this is the left atrium. That is the left ventricle. So we see, we putting in a bubble on the right side of the heart. Okay. So what it's is this? The... What is this? Is the coronary sinus? No, coronary sinus is a structure that we can see from the right side of the heart. So this left side of the atrium. Oh, uh, okay. What go into the left atrium ceiling? It's the lower pulmonary vein. Pulmonary so, vein. This is a pulmonary vein, okay? And did you notice that the bubble actually go into that pulmonary vein? So when you put a bubble on the right side of the heart, it actually go from the left pulmonary vein into oh. the left atrium. From the left pulmonary vein, it go into the left atrium. Okay, so this is a nice example of someone with atrial venous malformation and you can actually see the bubble go from the right side to the left heart, not through the shunt but through the pulmonary vein. 
the reason that it appears longer, of course, because it have to travel to the pulmonary artery and pulmonary vein and back to the heart, rather than straight to the shunt. Okay, is that clear? Mm, yeah. Is Sarah okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, is it intrapulmonary shunt? PFO, I told you it's not PFO. Pulmon partial anomalous pulmonary vein connection does not cause bubble to be to be going into the right side of the heart. So remember, if you have partial anomalous pulmonary vein, let's say you put in a bubble, the bubble still need to go to the lung to reach that anomalous pulmonary vein. So the bubble will still be destroyed. It is not sinus venosus ASD because it comes gradually. Okay, it doesn't come in a puff and it comes later than three bits. So I would expect in intracardiac shunt, the bubble will appear in the left heart within three heartbeats. From the bubble study, we can see that the bubble only appear on the six bits, much more consistent with pulmonary atrial venous malformation. Furthermore, in intracardiac shunt, we will expect a flash of bubble that appear then disappear rather than in AVM where the bubble steadily fills the heart. If you look carefully at the second image, you can see bubble come from the left upper pulmonary vein. Sorry, left lower pulmonary vein. You are right. Right, so this is another example of a case. Right, this case number five. So look properly at the case. So this is again main format LV, right ventricle. Okay, we have a pericardial effusion there. Okay. LV, right ventricle in pericardial effusion. LV, pericardial effusion. So let's say I tell you that this patient have an episode of myocardial infarction. Okay, the patient collapse and you see this kind of echocardiogram. So what is your diagnosis? The LV aneurysm. Okay. Uh, rupture. Rupture. Yes. Yep, this is a, what, what kind of LV rupture? rupture? What uh, kind of rupture? rupture? So this is a free wall rupture. Mm -hmm. when, free when, wall rupture. Yeah, whenever you do a patient with MI and you do echo and the echo look like this with a, what we call a coagula inside the pericardial space, okay, pre blood inside the pericardial space, only think of, always think of free wall rupture. How do you manage ventricular free wall rupture? There. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have to go to operation straight away. Yeah? Okay. So it's not ventricular septal rupture. Ventricular septal rupture will cause ventricular septal defect. It is a free wall rupture. It is not a papillary muscle rupture and it is not a pseudo aneurysm. Okay, pseudo aneurysm is a contained rupture. This rupture is not contained. So patient will either be in shock or in a state of collapse. Anytime there is new or suspected new pericardial effusion, especially with a clot inside pericardial space, it is free wall rupture until proven otherwise. You know, sometimes we can demonstrate communication between the LV cavity, either using color or LV contrast agent. So this patient only hope for survival is immediate trip to the operating theater. This is this patient punya heart. See that? <laughs> okay, this patient is actually, uh, we are, it is able to save the patient. Okay, this is a Mayo Clinic patient. Yeah. So, so that is the free war rupture. Right? <laughs> it's spurting. Okay. Spurting, okay. All right. Okay. So, survive, so, huh? wow. survive. So this is a patient. This is a, a, a transesophageal echocardiography view of a, a patient with, so this is the pulmonary, so this is the iota on top here, and this is a superior vena cava. Okay. <laughs> what is this structure here at the bottom of the superior vena cava? Should be right atrium. Okay, so do you think this is the right atrium? So this top here is SVC. Okay, what about this, this here? Ceiling? Not sure. Um, yeah. sorry, pardon. Yeah. This is at what level? I mean, upper esophageal. Just I tell you this is SVC and what is this? Mm. Does this top one and down one look, look the same or not the same? Same. Look the same. So if this is SVC, what is this? IVC. <laughs> <laughs> side by side, side by side, SVC and IVC. Okay. Uh, right. Okay. So that is not. Let's see. I say this is also SVC. So what is the analysis? Cardinal vein? <laughs> no, it's also SVC. Oh, it's also anomalous. Yeah. So I just wanted to show you because in the exam, right, they like to show you artifact. Okay. I wanted to make you understand what is artifact. Actually, this is actually artifact. This is not a real structure. 
So this mm-hmm. is an artifact of the SVC on top of this. Okay. Now let's see if I say this is artifact. What kind of artifact is this? Let's say you have it mm-hmm. exam, right? Okay. So because I wanted to teach you different different artifacts. So what kind of artifact is this? The reverberation. So this is not a reverberation artifact. Okay. Let's say that I tell you this bright thing here is actually something that is reflecting the image. Okay, you have a bright thing here and then you have a same structure here and here. What is this called? This is a mirror image artifact. Mm. Okay, now the problem with artifact is a lot of people uh, get confused with artifact. So basically I teach you, okay, let's talk about mirror image artifact first. So what is mirror image artifact? It is the same structure that is reflected through a reflector that is bright. So in this situation, the reflector is this wall of the Sukhidev Vidakava here. So you have reflection. Now, in relation with mirror effect artifact, so I just show you because I think this is important. Uh, so usually let's say you have a structure, right? Let's say this is so ceiling. Right? <laughs> okay. So that is so ceiling. So let's say so ceiling uh, stand in front like a bright reflector. Okay. Then you see the artifact there. Okay. That is the mirror artifact. Okay. Now the mirror artifact, the distance of the mirror image is the same as the distance of the object to the reflector. So you have to see something bright in the middle that is the that caused this mirror artifact to happen. Okay, and the movement of the artifact is opposite. So, like for example, if let's say ceiling is moving there, the mirror will go there. Okay, ceiling is moving upward, the mirror will go the other way around. So that is mirror artifact. Okay, so what about reverberation artifact? So reverberation artifact happen when the structure itself has become the reflector. Okay, now let's say this is precious. Okay, so let's say this is the ultrasound beam. Yeah, so that's the ultrasound beam. Okay. So what happened is, so this is precious, right? So the ultrasound beam get 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 one signal from precious, okay, and then receive back. So that is the first image that they accept of precious. However, sometimes they go again to precious and then they come back again. So now they have gone twice the distance. So the computer will think that there is another structure at twice the distance. So one, twice, another precious there. <laughs> right okay but this time it will move the same way if they say this precious move there this other precious also will move there this precious move there the other precious also will move there so that is reverberation in mirror artifact there is other structure that becoming the mirror and the thing move opposite way in reverberation artifact you yourself are the reflector and because the thing move twice so once your image another one one Two is the other image, so you have reverberation one there. So if they say it continue, then you also have another one there. I mean, it should be the same size, like I don't mean that the reverberation of precious is fatter than the real. Okay, it's just <laughs> artifact. Is that clear, guys? Yes. Okay. So, so that's how I I I understand it. <laughs> okay. I think it's quite quite useful. Okay. So that is actually a mirror artifact of the superior Vinakava. Right. Uh, how to avoid the artifact? You have to avoid the reflector, but it's difficult. One of the most common reflector, number one, is, for example, your pericardium, right? So how to get rid of pericardium is difficult. So the one of the way is just to put the color, but sometimes color, it can try to avoid the artifact, you know? So, so as if it looks like a normal structure, because when color go through there, it can, you have to decide, is that a normal structure or is that artifact? But sometimes color cannot differentiate. So even artifact they think is a normal structure and color will avoid going through this so color can be useful but sometimes cannot uh, one way of to 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 see is that even though color might not pass through it but color won't be turbulent across artifact so artifact won't cause turbulence so you won't see a turbulent flow around the artifact okay and another one artifact should not be appear in a different view of the same structure so from parasternal long axis to short axis it should not be present still okay mm -hmm. Right. So that is a mirror image artifact. So reverberation, I've taught you. 
there's also other artifact that I am difficult for me to explain logically. Because like the mirror image and reverberation, I can explain to you logically. But side loop, I can only give you an example, okay? Uh, in terms of the physics, maybe you need to batch it. But this is very important if you want to take board exam anytime. Because they always come out with this kind of uh, question and people always get it wrong because they don't understand. So there is other artifact that called side loop artifact and beam width artifact. So a uh, side loop artifact is where you see a, an image that adjacent but lateral to the other without any reflector. So for example, obviously our name, next person will be Saravanan. <laughs> so if let's say you see Saravanan here, okay, and then suddenly you see a Saravanan at the side here. <laughs> so okay, there is no reflector between the two Saravanan. It's not like there is a reflector. <laughs> and Saravanan itself not become a reflector for himself. Okay, it's just like two Saravanan out of nowhere. Okay, so this is what we call a side lobe artifact. There is a physics behind it, but I don't know what is that. Okay, I, I couldn't explain it to you. I just wanted to make you aware of the different type of artifacts. So mirror image, reverberation, side lobe, bin width. So this is of course a, uh, so, so this is of course a mirror image. So what we see is a left superior vena cava. So just now, uh, Precious mentioned about cardinal vein. So cardinal vein is actually a vein during the embryological development. So you have two cardinal vein. You have left anterior cardinal vein and right anterior cardinal vein. So right anterior cardinal vein will become superior vena cava, the one that we have. The left anterior cardinal vein should disappear. If let's say your left anterior cardinal vein does not disappear, that's why you have your left superior vena cava. So left superior vena cava always drain into the coronary sinus, which is the left part of the embryological sinus spinosis. The right part of embryological sinus spinosis will become the smooth part of the right atrium. Okay, the left and right, as we see, it can be connected. And if it's connected, it is connected by a brachiocephalic vein. Okay. Now in mirror image artifact, as I said, the object is reflected by another strong reflector and it moves in the opposite way to the structure. Okay, now this is another example that I wanted to show you. Okay, now this is whenever you see an artifact where one of the structure interlink with the other, that is called your refraction. Okay, the example that I give you today, just now, the two images are separate from each other. So whenever you see an image that is interlink with each other, that is called your refraction. Okay, this is a refraction artifact, a refraction artifact. So remember, if something is interlinked with each other, that is a refraction artifact. Alright, so this is an example of reverberation artifact, okay? This is an example of reverberation artifact. So, for example, so this is your uh, pulmonary artery. So, this is your ascending iota. So, so what happened in this situation is, okay, you have your pulmonary artery here, okay? So, this pulmonary artery, and then you have this line here, okay? Well, what happened is it reverberate. You can see you have... a uh, ultrasound source there it goes through the wall here so it goes through the wall here so that is a real image okay however it go back to the ultrasound okay twice so you have another image second one here that might look like a, a dissecting flap so you have two images so this is the real one this is reverberation it is not mirror image why you don't see any reflector in the middle of them okay so one more time so this is the source of the ultrasound it go one so that is the first image. It go one, two, then it it interpret that as a second image. And the second image, as you can see, the distance is twice the image at the beginning. So if you see this in your TEE and you see a line here, just make sure that it is not a reverberation from the line on top there. Is it clear for this one? Yeah. Sarah, okay now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, ceiling, okay. Mm. All right. So you may see it continue, right? You can actually see this one some more down here, and furthermore, it can go. So that is information information of the part. Okay. All right. So so this is another one. So this is a mirror image of the IVC. So in this case, you see the reflector. So the leaf sector is the wall there. So you see a reflector in the middle. So you have a mirror image of the IVC. So that is true IVC. That is the mirror image of IVC. This is another one. Okay. In this situation, you see that the pericardium itself is the reflector. Right? You see that is the anterior mitral valve leaflet. You see another anterior mitral valve leaflet down here. Okay. So this is the mirror image. You see one, one, and you see a reflector. So this is not reverberation. So this and this will go opposite. 
So when this go here, this will go there. When this go the other way, that will be done. So this another example of a mirror image artifact. Okay, I feel like I'm speaking to myself. You okay or not? Yeah. I don't know whether you all understand. Yeah. All right. So let's see this one. So this is a parasternal long axis view. Okay, and we do a bubble test. Okay, so we do a bubble test of this parasternal long axis view. Okay, just look nicely. I will play one more time. So we start now. Okay, start the bubble test. Okay. I give you one more time. Can you tell me whether you got it or not? Okay, one more time. Okay, what's your diagnosis? We go one by one. Start with Sarah first. This is a mirror image. Is it? <laughs> huh? What bubble? What what the bubble got to do with mirror image? This is, not <laughs> this is not artifact question. So I put a okay. bubble in this vision. Oh. Okay. So this it's happened. Natural. So this is a parasternal long axis view. Left ah, atrium, yeah. left ventricle, iota. Left atrium, left ventricle, iota, right ventricle. So what is happening here? Okay. So VST. Okay, so ceiling say it's VSD. Okay, so if it is a VSD ceiling, so what the hell is happening here? Why is this part also got bubble? Coronary sinus. Okay, so uh, uh, precious, what's your diagnosis? The persistent left superior vena cava. Okay, persistent left superior vena cava. Is it just persistent left superior vena cava or persistent left superior vena cava with unroofed for the sinus? Uh, if unroofed, then you can see uh, also bubble inside the left atrium. Yeah? Okay, but can you see bubble in the left atrium here? There is no bubble, right, inside the left atrium. So precious, know. precious is correct. Yeah, okay, no so pressure. So if you see, I put the bubble from the left brachial vein. Can you tell me the uh, journey of the bubble? So from the coronary sinus, we will go. So if, start start from the left superior vena cava first. Okay. Left superior vena cava will go to the. Uh, the left as left as we yeah, see go to where? Persistent left superior vena cava. Uh -huh. So yeah, the bubble the go RA. to LVC and then from LVC left as we see it goes to where? Correct. So if they say SVC go to the RA. No, it go to coronary sinus, lah, right? L, so bubble will go from the left SVC. Left SVC I, go to coronary yeah, sinus, yeah. right? Okay. So what happened in this situation? The patient have a bubble. You are right. Okay. The patient got a bubble inserted into the left brachial vein. The bubble go through the brachial cephalic, go to the superior vena cava, go to the superior vena cava, from the superior vena cava, go into coronary sinus first. So you see the coronary sinus light up here. If the patient have unroofed coronary sinus, this bubble should also go in the left atrium and the left ventricle, right? But this bubble does not go to the left atrium and left ventricle. Okay, so this is not unroofed. It goes straight to the right ventricle only. So this is a persistent left superior vena cava, but there is no unroofed coronary sinus. Is that clear? For unroofed coronary sinus, Hmm. Do you need to operate? Um, it depends. I think if they say you have a big one and then they have evidence of right heart dilatation, yes. If they say everything is normal, I don't think we need to do so. Sarah, okay or not? The persistent left SVC, you understand? Yes, yes. Ceiling, you understand? Hmm. Then from the from the coronary sinus, the uh, bubble go into the right, right ventricle. Right atrium, right ventricle. Because CS drain mm. into the right atrium, right? So it go to the right atrium and then go into the right ventricle. Mm. Okay. All if right. let's say you have unroof, it go to the CS and then it go to the left atrium, left ventricle, and also to the right atrium and right ventricle. And this one it doesn't go to the left atrium. I show you a, a next one. Using M mode is much much nicer. Look at this. CS. Right ventricle. Mm. See, it go to the CS. So you go to the right atrium and then you go to the right ventricle. You can see it never go into the left ventricle. Nice, right? Yeah. 
Uh, so this is someone with unroof con designers. Okay. So this is injection into the left brachial vein with persistent LF SVC, but there is no unroof con designers. Injection into right brachial vein will cause bubble go into the RA and RV normally from the right SVC. Injection into the left brachial vein in patient with unroofed CS will cause bubble to go into the CS, the intent into the left and right side of the heart. Option D is not related to the image at all. Hello, got uh, sinus venous defect. What happened? Sinus same venous thing. defect. You just see a normal shunt. So if you see you have a sinus venous defect, if you mm. put inside the right atrium, you will see bubble inside the left side of the heart. But you couldn't see the shunt because the shunt it will go through that sinus venous. Like it's the same as you put with PFO or ASD. You see shun on the, you see bubble on the right on the left side. You see you uh -huh. put a, a bubble, then you see it go into the right side. Then you see suddenly it appear on the left side, just like a PFO or normal ASD. I mean, together with the left SVC, kalau got the sinus venous defect, it is oh. same like. Kalau kalau got sinus venous defect, then yeah, you masukkan into the left, uh, you masukkan to the left brachial vein, and then it go to CS. Then CS will go to the right side of the heart, so it will bubble the right side. But later, it will go to the left side of the heart through that uh, sinus venous defect. Yeah. Hmm. Something like uh, unroof or so lah. Correct, correct. Okay. Alright. So the answer is option C. In persistent left SPC, the bubble will go into CS first, then into the right atrium and the right ventricle. Okay. Diagnosis, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So this is the M mode across the aortic valve. So diagnosis. Maybe we start this time with ceiling first. Mm, my true diagnosis. Uh, across the aortic valve ceiling. Oh, across the aortic valve. Uh. Uh, don't know. So what happened here? What happened? This is the now one leaflet of the aortic valve. That's another leaflet of the aortic valve. So what happened? What happened to the closure? The closure is early or the closure is mid? Mid. So this is a mid systolic closure of the aortic valve. So what con what condition that you remember that caused mid systolic closure of the aortic valve? Okay, precious. Mm. I was thinking, I think I've seen this before. Mm. This is a very, very uh, frequent question in the exam. Okay, Sarah? Prolapse, is it? Prolapse of what? Okay, I'll give you another no, clue. So this is IOTA, right? So this is actually across the leaflet. You can see also fluttering of this mitral valve, uh, the aortic valve leaflet. You can see fluttering of the leaflet. In what situation that you can see fluttering of the leaflet? Mm. Mitral. Okay. Okay. Uh, Increase LV EDP. So if you see AK, uh, okay. Uh, Sarah say is AR. So severe AR. If you see the jet is eccentric, so you can have the the jet directed towards the anterior mitral valve leaflet and cause the anterior mitral valve leaflet to flutter. Okay, yeah. but this is not mitral valve. This is IOT yeah. valve. Okay. So, um, ceiling is talking about LVEDP. So, LVEDP, usually, if they say MOD, if you have severe AR uh, and the LVEDP is very high, what happens is that you have the premature closure of the mitral valve in diastole. So, the diastole haven't finished yet. The mitral valve have already closed. And also, premature opening of the aortic valve during diastole, meaning that systole hasn't appeared, but the aortic valve is already open. So that, but that is different. In this situation, you have a mid-systolic closure of the aortic valve, and you have fluttering of the valve. Okay, so what condition do you remember that cause obstruction through the left ventricular outflow tract? Occam. Yes. So this is a very classic example of dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, like Occam. Okay, the reason this is dynamic is the closure is at mid. If let's say you have a closure that is early, that is, that is, wait, uh, let, 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 let get this announcement, get away first. Wear a face mask that properly covers both your nose and mouth while on Mayo Clinic campus. Thank you for your help. 
Okay, so in dynamic LVOT obstruction, the closure is made in district subiotic stenosis. It is actually directly the closure is straight away. So this is just remember this is the loop of MOD in patient with dynamic LVOT obstruction. Another tips is whenever you see fluttering right of the aortic valve leaflet, if there is obstruction, the obstruction cannot be at the level of the aortic valve. So it this can only happen for subiotic obstruction, be it. Uh, hocum or subaortic membrane this fluttering okay so this is fluttering with mid systolic closure this is a dynamic lvot obstruction not subaortic membrane i will show you the mode of subaortic membrane later uh, of course not supraaortic stenosis and this is uh, which is part of william syndrome and uh, not acute severe arterial regurgitation so this is what ceiling was talking about just now okay all right so this is number 13 so this is a parasternal long axis view All right. Okay, maybe wanted to tell some diagnosis. So this is parasternal long axis. What do you see here, ceiling? Do you see turbulence across the ITIC valve or not? Mm, okay. okay, this ITIC valve here. Okay, there is turbulence across the ITIC valve, right? Mm, AR is it? Nope. Stenosis. Huh. It is during systole. Okay, it is during mm. systole. It's okay. All right. So let's go. To, let, so that is the first image. Okay, so that is the first image. So this is the second image. Okay, that is a short axis of the aortic valve. Right. Mm. Okay. Now there is turbulent flow across the aortic valve. So what is your diagnosis? Mm. Like a membrane. membrane. Very good. Okay, you can see here there is a subaortic membrane there. Okay, there is subaortic membrane there. Right. Look at that. Where is the membrane? Very tiny ceiling. That's where. The previous, the you previous see? view is better. Okay. Okay. Let's. Okay. Here. Okay. This one. Yeah. Just very. This, the, this thing that jutting out here. Very tiny. So the reason I show you this is for you to just beware of the presence of subaortic membrane. Okay, especially like you know, ceiling was a bit a bit confused just now. The reason being the turbulence actually start here. The turbulence don't start at the aortic valve, but the turbulence starts be before the aortic valve here. Okay, that's why it, it looks like aortic regurgitation. This is not this is actually aortic stenosis secondary to sub aortic membrane. Another clue is if you look at this view here, when you look at the aortic valve, the aortic valve is actually opening normally. Correct or not? It's precious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the aortic valve is opening normally. So where does the turbulence come? The turbulence come from the subaortic membrane. Okay. So that's an example of a subaortic membrane. So I let it play again. Last time. So example of subaortic membrane there. Okay. So this is the M mode across the subaortic membrane. So this is typical. You see that early closure. So straight away close. Okay. Ceiling, can you tell the difference between this and hooker? Mm. Right, this one it's open, close. That's it. Open, close. That's it. Okay. okay. This is okay. This is and they also have fluttering. And that fluttering is okay for subaortic obstruction. They always got fluttering, both. But for subaortic obstruction, it goes straight up and down. Okay. For dynamic obstruction, you can see it go up, it open a little bit, then baru close. Mid systolic closure. For subaortic stenosis. It go up, then it go down. Is that clear, Sili? Mm. Okay, uh, Sarah, okay. Um, then they, they will behave like uh, AS or so. Lah. Yeah, will behave like AS. If you do a Doppler in patient with uh, dynamic LVOT obstruction, you have the dagger shape like that. Okay. In patient with mm. sub itis stenosis, you got just exactly like the one that you have with patient with uh, itis stenosis. Right. If, okay. if if the same thing, mm -hmm. if AS, how, how does it appear in a, uh, ah, a, a, a mode? A mode is just like this. So you have a, exactly the same thing. It's just that you have uh, you have like, like this. Okay. So so what happens is that you have sp smaller separation and a thicken. Right. So this is more thicken. This separation is smaller. Okay. But there's no such thing like this. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. 
So this is closure at which which phase? This early closure. So during early systole, you already close. Mm. Okay. So this is end diastole, right? Early systole already close. Mm. Okay. So the likely diagnosis is subiotic membrane. So the patient have trileaflet aortic valve. This is not supraiotic stenosis. This is not gooseneck deformity. So ceiling, you remember this uh, item gooseneck deformity, right? What do no. this in a little bit? So this is someone. You remember someone that I tell you? Have did you watch my ASD uh, lecture? I was there. Okay. <laughs> give the lecture. <laughs> okay, so uh, you remember in patient with ASD primum or patient with AVSD, so what happened is the uh -huh. aortic valve is unwedged from the mitral and the tricuspid valve. So what happened is you got elongated left ventricular outflow tract. So that is what mm. we call gooseneck deformity. So it have nothing to do with this. Okay. Mm. Okay. All right. So look at this. Okay, what valve is that? Uh, precious. Again. Again. Look at this. Look, look like this. Look like look like at these images. What valve is that? Um, pulmonic valve. Okay, pulmonic valve. What happened to the color flow? Mm -hmm. Looks like it doesn't flow. So yeah, color flow, systole and diastole. So what happened? Is there stenosis, regurgitation, or is normal? Sarah, stenosis, regurgitation, or normal? Uh, got both. But got both. No stenosis. Okay, look at the degree of the stenosis. Okay, you see the stenosis is, is got, but not so bad. Because severe is when the velocity is more than 4 meter per second. But this one is only mm. about 2 meter per second. So there mm. is a two. But more importantly, what is the regurgitation? You see, it's triangular. You see, the regurgitation is triangular. You see, it's triangular. So this is mild, moderate, or severe pulmonary regurgitation. Severe, okay. When you have severe. a tri triangular shape like this, okay, mm. it is a severe pulmonary regurgitation because you have a rapid equalization between your pulmonary artery and your right ventricular pressure. So this is a very severe, okay. Whenever you see a triangular right shape, so the patient has severe pulmonary regurgitation. Even more severe if let's say you have something like this, okay, but rather than close late it goes early so you have like this right you have a long period of time where there is no flow that is also shows severe pulmonary regurgitation so what is do you think the cause of this severe pulmonary regurgitation it's because of dilatation okay possible okay. look at this pulmonary yeah. valve what does your pulmonary valve remind you of what you can view if you look at the leaflet tips right what how do you characterize the movement of the pulmonary valve Tethering and tenting. Okay, one of it is tethering and tenting, so that's fine. But this is rather than tethering and tenting. This leaflet look more like it doesn't move at all. Correct or not? Uh -huh. Okay, it doesn't move at all. It retracted like what uh, Sarah say, but it doesn't move. Okay, let's say I say that this leaflet is retracted and doesn't move. And like, what if I say exactly the same thing happened in the tricuspid valve? So what do you think the condition is? Epstein. <laughs> no? <laughs> Happen atresia, at family atresia. No. no, you know what is atresia. So when we talk about atresia, we mean there is no connection. So whenever we say pulmonary atresia, what we mean is there is no connection between right ventricular outflow tract and pulmonary artery. When we say tricuspid atresia, meaning that there is flow, there is no connection between the right atrium and right ventricle. That is what atresia means. So this is obviously the pulmonary valve leaflet is there. So this is not atresia. I told you the mm -hmm. exact same thing happened in tricuspid valve. So what is your diagnosis? Alright, I think if I give you the the differential, you will, you will got it. Okay. So this is an example of calcinoid pulmonary valve disease. Okay. So calcinoid can happen in pulmonary valve also. And most often it causes more regurgitation than stenosis. So this is someone with severe calcinoid pulmonary disease with pulmonary regurgitation. Okay, uh, this, yes. sorry, sorry, I got one question. Calcinoid yep. pulmonary valve means uh, the pulmonary valve has calcinoid, is it? 
No, they, they just mean that you you know when you have a carcinoid disease, you have the uh, the secretion of hormone, yeah. hormone right? The five yeah. hydroxytryptamine, the hormone is the one that cause changes in this leaflet. Oh. Okay, the hormone is that cause changes in this leaflet. So this leaflet tips is not that the carcinoid mass itself is going into the leaflet. No, it is okay. the changes of the leaflet secondary to this hormone. Okay, so the changes will be restricted. So it wow, restricted and retracted. So you see, you see the valve is like half open like that. Yeah. It, it doesn't have that sound. <laughs> right. So this is another view. So this is not a manual format. So L A R A L V R V K. Sarah, you want to comment? This is uh, intramyocardial hematoma. So one of the differential diagnosis is intramyocardial dissecting hematoma. But intramyocardial dissecting hematoma, usually you will see a layer of endocardium there. Yeah. So let's say that this is not intramyocardial dissecting hematoma. So let's say I see that this is not. So what are the differential diagnosis other than intramyocardial dissecting hematoma? Mm. A clot? Yes. Uh, so this is apical clot. Okay. Apart from apical clot, what about the color, Sarah? There's a, is that an MR? Uh. Yes, there is mitral regurgitation as well. Okay, there's yeah. mitral regurgitation. Let's look at the next picture here. Okay, so what do you see in that posterior mitral valve leaflet there, Sarah? Yeah. Calcified, restricted. Okay, can you comment on the leaflet itself? Disjunction, I don't know. Okay, the disjunction is when the posterior wall is actually have a distance from the posterior mitral valve leaflet. So this is not disjunction. No. Hmm. Hmm. How hmm. comment your comment? Just just what do you see in that posterior leaflet? Don't you think it's look abnormal? Yeah, it is like rounded and. Okay. and is that, is that even leaflet there? Like is, that a, even a, is that even a leaflet there? When it moves, I mean, it doesn't look like there is a leaflet, but when it moves, like a yeah. pleated, so pleated structure. Correct. So it looks like the leaflet is destroyed, basically, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is actually a leaflet that is destroyed. So you have a fibrosis of the posterior mitral valve leaflet and also destruction of the posterior mitral valve leaflet. This is actually directly... Uh, related to the apical clot. So let's say I say this is directly related to the apical clot. What is your diagnosis? And let's say the patient also have right ventricle apical clot. Ah, hyper eosinophilic syndrome. Yes, hyper eosinophilic syndrome. So this is a... So, so this is example of patient with eosinophilic um, allophilic endocarditis. So what happened is the patient have LV and RV apical clot. So the clot also cause fibrosis and actually the fibrosis is very typically go to the left ventricle all the way here into the basal infrolateral. Okay, so that is this is allophilic bio endomyocarditis. You are right. Okay, so the patient also have LV and RV apical clot. So this is eosinophilic heart disease. Oh, quite nice. Huh? You also uh, think that it's intramyocardial dissecting hematoma. All right, so let's look at this one. Okay, Siling, what do you think this one is? Mm, play again. Okay, I'll play again. <sighs> It's very thickened aortic valve. Yes, it's very thickened aortic valve leaflet, right? So, uh, look at the, look at the flow. So, what do you think about the color flow of the through the aortic valve? Uh, aortic stenosis. Okay, so there, it seems like there is an obstruction, right? So, why do you think there is obstruction uh, across the aortic valve? Due to calcified aortic valve. 
Okay, so what you see is you can see that there is a mass in the aortic valve, correct or not, uh, Selim? Mm. There is a mass in the aortic valve, okay? So this mass is possibly can be thrombus. It can also be a vegetation. I just wanted to tell you that vegetation and thrombus can also cause obstruction and not only cause regurgitation. So there is an obstruction there. Now, let's see, I see you that the patient have metastatic small lung cancer. Okay, so what is the most likely diagnosis? Okay, you will say the patient has metastatic lung cancer and you see mass in the aortic valve. So the patient is afibrile and the blood culture are consistently negative. Oh, this is marantic. Yes, correct. So this is marantic endocarditis. Nice. This is marantic endocarditis. Okay. So this is marantic endocarditis. You are right. All right. So this is a next case. So this is a parasternal long axis view. Okay. So that's the left atrium. That is the left ventricle. Okay. That is the descending iota. So that's the parasternal long axis view there. Okay. All right, let's see. Pressures. Can you see any abnormalities? Um. Yeah, I play again. Uh. So left atrium. I know the, the picture is not so clear, but it's a left atrium, left ventricle, and that's right ventricle. Okay, Sarah, can you see any abnormalities? You're clearly. What, what do you think about the tips of the mitral valve leaflet? Thicken oh, and like uh, there are two layers like that. Is yes, that, that? it looks like, okay, let's say if you see this, right? What is your differential analysis? Parachute mitral valve. <laughs> no. <laughs> so no. it looks like there is a fluffy, ma fluffy mass right? ah, on top of that mm. mitral valve leaflet. There's a fluffy mass there. It looks like a kissing mass, we call it. Right? A kissing mass oh. on the tips of the mitral valve leaflet. Alright, so this is another view for you. Okay. Ah, can you see the mess better now? Maybe not better. Yeah. <laughs> but you can see the mess, yeah. right? And like yeah. a kissing mess at the microbuff leaflet. Vegetation. Alright, so it looks like a vegetation, right? It looks like a vegetation, but this is a typical appearance of a particular type of vegetation. Okay, whenever you see a kissing mess on the microbuff leaflet like this, okay, like this. So this patient have known dose of systemic mm -hmm. lupus erythematosus. Okay, so now everyone knows the diagnosis, right? So what is the explanation <laughs> of the abnormality? So this is a ligament sac endocarditis. Very typical. You have a kissing leaflet, kissing mass on the mitral valve leaflet. Kissing. So Can I ask kissing mass meaning? I don't know. It seems like the mass on the tips of the anterior mitral valve leaflet, on the tips of the posterior mitral valve leaflet, then it kisses. Ah, like that. A mass on both the anterior and posterior. Yes, correct. Okay, but can't, I mean, normal normal endocarditis also can happen like that. Also right? can, yes, definitely, correct. Okay, but just this is more common in patient with treatment sac endocarditis. Mm, okay. Hey, can you see again, sorry? Sure. Kissing. Seems like the best is kissing each other. So it has to be both bilateral. It doesn't have uh, to be la. It doesn't have to be. So you can still have Lehman sac even with one leaflet. But if you see okay. this, I think it is more specific. Classical. So it's like, like it's very classical of Lehman sac endocarditis. Okay. okay. All right. So this is an example of Lehman sac. It's not papillary fibroelastoma. It is not infective endocarditis. It's apical maxima. So this is Lehman sac endocarditis. Okay. This is. I show you another picture. I think I show you three picture. I don't know whether one picture is clearer than the other. Oh, that is, you see the, leaf, the tips of the leaflet, you have a best there. So that is the ligament sac endocarditis, okay? Mm. So that's another example of ligament sac endocarditis. This is transesophageal echocardiogram. Mm -hmm. So left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, and also right atrium there. The AMVL looks like layering, like, it, you know, like two layers. That's oh. reverberation, is it? Yes. That is not that is not real. <laughs> that, is, that is not real. Yeah, that is I don't know what what I think, but that is not real. Sarawanan. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
So this is another echocardiogram. Okay, that's another echocardiogram of a patient. Okay. So let's say I say to you that so this patient have uh so if you can see that. So just I just want to tell you that this patient have left ventricular hypertrophy. Oops. First time this happened today. You know what happened? It crashed. Mm -hmm. First time. Mm -hmm. all, okay. okay. So this patient have a left ventricular hypertrophy. And the left ventricle have this uh, binary appearance. Okay, let's... Uh, wait, I just share it. Share screen. Okay, share. Um, okay. So, can you see the slideshow? Yeah. So, you have a binary mm -hmm. appearance. So, you have this endocardial layer that is bright. You have that epicardial layer that is bright. Okay. So, patient also have left ventricular hypertrophy. So, this is a 53 years old. The patient have rash on his body. And eye, eye exam showed the cornea being opaque. Okay, what would you do next? A, send alpha galoxylosidase enzyme level. B, mm -hmm. send serum electrophoresis with immunofixation and serum free light chain level. C, send for pyrophosphate PET scanning. D, send for ferritin and iron level. Okay, what is the answer? A. Yes. So this is a Anderson's Fabry disease. Now sometimes patients with Anderson's Fabry disease have this appearance. We call it binary appearance of the heart. This is not sensitive or specific, but if you just wanted to know what happened is that it seems like the left ventricle have a two layer. So you have one layer here in the endocardium. So you have one bright spot there and you have another bright spot there. Okay. So this is the binary appearance. It's by no means uh, specific or sensitive. I just wanted to tell you what do I mean by binary appearance. Okay. So, um, precious, what is yeah. the when you have don't have alpha galactosidase enzyme or very little alpha galactosidase enzyme level? What happen? What accumulate? Glibo something glycosid. <laughs> So it is called glibo globo triacyl serum. Okay, it's a, an accumulation of globo triacyl serum. So that's Anderson Fabry disease. So the rash, right? What does it call the rash, Ravana? The rash. Ah, the rash that patient with Anderson Fabry disease have. Glows, I forgot. Ten figures. I don't know that. It's called angiokeratoma. It's mm -hmm. called angiokeratoma, so they will have angiokeratoma. They will have also have this, uh, they call it opacification of the cornea, HORL-like, W-H-O-R-L. Okay, they can also have kidney problem. Okay, so what is the mode of inheritance for Anderson's family disease, uh, Sarah? x -ling. x -ling. So it is x -ling recessive, but can it... Recessive. So it is x -ling recessive, okay, but can it affect women or not? X-Ling recessive. So okay. supposedly, x recessive cannot affect women, yeah. but Anderson Fabry, it can. So women is also affected. Okay, it's just that women is affected less severely than men in patients with Anderson's Fabry disease. Right? So this is Anderson's Fabry disease. So this is the binary appearance of myocardium. It is not sensitive, but previously thought to be specific, but I think people don't use it anymore. Uh, they have rashes that is called angiokeratoma and they can have whole like opification of the cornea. So this is an x link recessive. Female can still be affected, but the presentation is milder. Alpha galactosidase enzyme is diagnostic and enzyme replacement can be done. After this diagnosis, a genetic study can also be done. Okay, so this is example of the angiokeratoma there. Okay, the angiokeratoma and that is the whole like appearance of the cornea so they can have pain and this is a neuropathic crisis they have angiokeratoma peripheral vasospasm okay they can also have ophthalmological abnormalities but the problem is the presentation can be very subtle so i just suggest you every time a young each patient presented with left ventricular hypertrophy just send an alpha galactosidase enzyme level 
So this is number 19. Um, I wouldn't give you a quiz because this is uh, actually just a, a example. So this patient have a concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. So you know that differential diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy is either hypertension, hypertrophic stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, cardiac amyloidosis, and the Fabry disease. What I wanted to show you is like all other rarer cause of left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, so this is a patient that have skeletal myopathy, have concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, and have this LAM2 mutation. So what is the diagnosis? So I, I, you know, anyone want to try? Nothing to do with the echo, just other different analysis of left ventricular hypertrophy. So anyone remember what disease where you have LAM2 mutation? LAM2. Burgess, what the, the... Danons, okay. This is a Danons disease. Danons. Okay? Just remember that one other uh, differential diagnosis, but very, very rare. That's why I never asked you to remember. Okay, but since we, I got the image of the cases, I just wanted to show you an example of Danons disease because I've never seen Danons disease before. Well, this patient have Danons disease. So this is a oh. lack of function of LAM2. It is X-linked dominant inability to transport cellular material into lysosomes. The patient will have skeletal myopathy, cognitive dysfunction, and also cardiomyopathy. So next example, okay. So pressure is what you can see in the heart. The, the, the walls are thickened. Oh, yes, there's also abnormal wall thickness here, okay. So again, your differential analysis, pressures. Uh, home, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, hypertension, AS, um, the infectious diseases such as amyloidosis and Fabry's disease. All right. Okay, so this is another example of patient with left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, yep. did, I, did I give you the idea? Yeah. yeah, so this is someone with Frederick ataxia. Okay, this is someone with another example. You can see a very big left ventricular hypertrophy. This patient passed away already, young patient, but again, a big left ventricular hypertrophy. So this is not for, you know, I don't think this is for practical purposes because obviously you can already see that the patient have ataxic and stuff. But just for exam purposes, this can happen, you know, all these differential analysis. So today I I show you Danone's and also show you Frederick Ataxia. Yeah. Right. So um, maybe I think for this uh, session, we stop here because I think uh, you are tired. Uh, so why don't we continue the next uh, session? Uh, maybe what do you think about uh, Friday or tomorrow? Which one do you prefer? Uh, 